All right, so I'll start off the panel by doing the mandatory disclaimer that uh, these remarks are not uh, are my own and don't necessarily reflect the official policy of the United States Military Academy of the Army. Uh, so getting that out of the way, so it's a pleasure to moderate the final panel of the day, the way forward, what's the sustainable end game. So pro I'll provide kind of a stage setter, then do extremely brief uh, intros of the panelists, and then I'll keep our questions up here relatively short to try to maximize the uh, audience ability to ask the panelists questions. Uh, so I'll start by describing the uh, environment that we're operating under uh, here in terms of the, you know, the end game that we're trying to get to, the challenging environment, right? We, so we start out with the illegal annexation of the Crimea. Uh, we're, we're under Minsk II right now uh, that Ukraine signed under duress, right, to the Ukrainians. They really view that, uh, as David pointed out earlier today, right, it's the Budapest Agreement that's the, the real agreement, uh, not Minsk in, in their, a lot of their views. Uh, right, we have this, so we have this tentative ceasefire that, you know, as Alexander pointed out earlier, uh, right, daily violations uh, to this, you know, constant shelling, probing, and casualties sustained on, on both sides uh, to include all the civilians. Uh, right, significant costs to both sides in terms of dollars and lives. Um, and the Russians, right, they really don't like their soldiers coming home in body bags any better than, than Americans or, or NATOs as well. Uh, we talked yesterday, I think last night, about, uh, or maybe it was earlier this morning, it's all running together, you know, over a million uh, I IDPs, internally displaced persons. Uh, and then we have the OSCE mission, right, that's a monitoring mission, not an enforcement mechanism, uh, of which one of the belligerents is a, a member of the OSCE monitoring mission. Uh, so, you know, as Alexander kind of uh, laid out earlier, I mean, they're doing an excellent job of, uh, within the constraints of their mandate, uh, but the challenges they face without having freedom of movement uh, within uh, portions of that. Uh, right, so U Ukraine obviously wants to regain the uh, control of their sovereign territory. Uh, and the Russians, y y you know, uh, it seems like they're probably less willing to uh, give up Crimea. Maybe uh, Donbass is a little different. Uh, but if you look at uh, the question we frequently have asked over the last two years is what's kind of the end state? So uh, for the last two years, been, uh, you know, helping to reform their, or helping them reform their defense establishment. Uh, but it's really been a status quo out in the east in terms of uh, what's the end state? And if the goal for Russia is not joining, uh, for them not to join NATO or the EU, they've been uh, fairly successful at that, and it's tough to do that when you have contested territory. Uh, but if they want, you know, a Ukraine that's uh, more aligned with them, you know, in the process, what they've done is alienated a good chunk of uh, their population. Uh, and then you look at, as we talked on the last panel, what's the acceptable cost to the to the Russians for this? Maybe it's a. Uh, it doesn't matter if they if they stumbled into Donbas if it was planned. Uh, they have what they have now, and maybe it's an acceptable cost, right? Is it relatively low cost for them to kind of keep the status quo uh, versus the burden that it is on Ukraine? And then in return, what are we spending for enhanced forward presence uh, brigades uh, in the Baltics and Poland and, and possibly Georgia's? Uh, uh, General Hodges pointed out, um, what's the cost of that, and, and is that having any effect on, 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 on what Russia is doing in Ukraine? Uh, so, right, given this, uh, you know, challenging environment, if you think, uh, you know, advising defense reform is challenging, uh, then trying to resolve the situation in Donbass uh, seems particularly daunting. Uh, so in July of 2017, uh, Rex Tillerson, our Secretary of State, named our first panelist, uh, Ambassador Kurt Volker, uh, uh, Volker, as a special representative for Ukraine negotiations. Uh, so we're excited to see him come on board, uh, former ambassador to NATO with an outstanding reputation. Uh, and also currently serving as executive director of the McCain Institute. Uh, so we'll hear from him first. And uh, also on the panel, we have uh, Michael Kaufman, a uh, researcher and expert on Russia uh, and the former Soviet Union, uh, fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Insti uh, Institute Center and advisor for military operations. Gene uh, Fischel, a career diplomat and senior advisor uh, in the Bureau of European and Eurasian Affairs in our Department of State. Uh, and Jill Sinclair, who you saw earlier, a senior defense advisor to Ukraine, or the Canadian DRAB member. Uh, so, sir, we'll t uh, Ambassador, we'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you, John, for twisting my arm to get me here. Uh, so, it, uh, <laughs> uh, it's a pleasure. And uh, I, I, I'm struck by a couple things I want to, to key off of in, in uh, framing a couple of thoughts to kick off the discussion here. One of them, um, I, I, what Ben Hodge just said, is that selling javelins is a policy, but it's not a strategy. So I think what maybe we should talk about is what's the strategy here? 
And I think the strategy has got to be, you know, to, to put it at the highest possible level, uh, we need to make sure that Ukraine is a success. And it isn't right now, not 100% anyway. Uh, it's got a ways to go. And so if we can make sure that Ukraine is successful as a democracy, as a market economy, as a prosperous society, as a fair and just society, and as a secure society, uh, it's going to be fine and these conflicts will be manageable. Um, they are being used by Russia right now as a device to exert pressure and influence upon Ukraine. And the more that Ukraine is successful on its own, the less effective those mechanisms can be. Um, along with that, so how do we do that? Well, partly it is to blunt this impact of Russian pressure and Russian influence. Uh, so we want to push back wherever possible. We're doing that. One of the most important ways to push back is the way we expose what Russia is doing. Transparency and clarity is very important. Uh, so uh, I always tell the story, I'm looking at Alexander now, the first visit I had to Ukraine, I was shown this map that said NGCA on it. And I was mystified, as, you know, what's this? And it turns out it stood for non-government controlled area. And thought, how far are we going to go to come up with ways to obscure Russia's responsibility? Um, there is a Ukrainian-controlled area and a Russian-controlled area, and we should just say so. And I think that is one of the examples of clarity of what we're talking about. Another part is that we need to be clear we're never going to accept Russia's annexation of, of Crimea, and we're never going to accept the, the people's republics that they established in Donetsk and Luhansk and their occupation of that territory. It's not legitimate, it's not real, and we shouldn't accept it. Now, that doesn't mean there's a military solution here that Ukraine can just you know, execute. They, they can't, and they shouldn't. Um, we, they have to play a different game. But we, as a matter of judgment, should not accept this. Um, another way of making sure uh, that uh, Russia pays costs here and realizes this is not getting them anything, it is to uh, keep the sanctions in place and to gradually increase them, which is what we are doing, and we urge the European Union to keep doing that with us. Uh, we, we, want, we think an important, an important signal to Russia is that the transatlantic community is unified. That's another dimension also politically to keep up the close work we're doing with France and Germany, the UK, Canada, Sweden, EU, NATO, et cetera. Make sure that Russia is not able to exploit divisions uh, within the West. Um, another is to try to demonstrate convincingly that Russia is failing at its principal objective. The principal objective is to have a Russia-friendly Ukraine, a Ukraine that sees itself as part of Russia's orbit. And what Russia has produced through its own efforts is a Ukraine that is more unified, more nationalist, more westward looking, more anti-Russian than ever existed before. And that is going to continue and continue as long as Russia keeps this up. And so hopefully they see that as well. And then we also need uh, to make sure that we're giving uh, Russia a way to solve this if it wants to, which is what this proposal for a peacekeeping mission is meant to do. But until they're ready, they're not going to do it. And, and so we should recognize that as reality. And then on the other side of the equation, helping Ukraine be successful, there's a lot that we need to do there. There, there is uh, the judiciary. There are efforts to fight corruption. There is transparency in politics. Um, there is media environment. Uh, there are lots of things that need to happen. But I'd say one of the most significant is uh, the oligarchic system itself, which acts as kind of a stranglehold on the country. Uh, it uh, discourages outside investment. It imposes costs inside the economy. It depresses GDP growth. Because of the vested interests at stake then, it uh, per permeates everything else, politics, governance, courts, anti-corruption efforts, broader business climate, certain policies like land reform and taxation, uh, and the media and the information environment. Uh, they're all polluted by this. So I think one of the important things we can do is try to work with Ukraine, the IMF, EU, others on how to transform this system, uh, to try to get to a point where it is not a political economy dominated by five or six individuals with vested interests, but one where there is 
diversification of assets and ownership, where there is competition, uh, and where there are rules that are respected going forward. And if we could achieve that, I think it would be uh, a tremendous gift to Ukraine to have a, an open and competitive economy as opposed to uh, a, um, a, a one held by a, a small number of people in, a, in kind of an oligarchic grip. Uh, that's something that uh, uh, I think will take time. It'll, it, it needs to have good legislation and good ideas and implementation. It needs to have backing from the U.S., the European Union, the IMF, and people in Ukraine. And you have to leave time for implementation. But I think it is a, a critical step that would help make Ukraine successful. And again, if Ukraine is successful as a country, that has huge implications for resolving these conflicts and also for the wider perspective in Europe. And uh, Georgia was mentioned here. Moldova was mentioned here. Russia was mentioned here. Uh, as I see it, if Ukraine is successful, we ultimately have uh, the basis of improving people's lives and stability, security, democracy, prosperity throughout that wider region, including Russia. If Ukraine is held back from that, we're going to have a long, protracted struggle with Russia, uh, and that's not what we want. So uh, I think seeing Ukraine as the, the fulcrum in that is critically important. So I'll pause there. All right, Ambassador, one, one short question. You, you talk about pushing back against Russian pressure or, or Russian pressure and the transparency and, clar uh, transparency and clarity. Uh, you know, obviously in the news here, we, we, we hear about Russian uh, election interference, but we really kind of ignore what they're doing within the Donbass. And, you know, they claim that the soldiers are on leave and going there on their own. But when, uh, you know, when General Ab when I was in General Abizade's uh, brigade as a lieutenant, we didn't take block leave together and take our tanks. Well, we didn't have tanks, but if we had tanks, we wouldn't drive into Canada. But you would have if you could have. Right. And drive. <laughs> we, we don't take block leave and take our tanks with us across the border. Uh, so uh, wh well, why do we do such a bad job of highlighting what Russia is actually doing? I have no idea. And I have no hesitation in, in talking about it. <laughs> and I don't know why others don't. Um, but we have a direct Russian chain of command over the military forces. We have two-star generals, one in the north in Luhansk, one in the south in Donetsk. They have embedded officers at every level in the chain of command all the way down to the company level. And Russia pays for the contract soldiers to then staff out the military force, um, which are then hired. And many of them are Russian. Many are from the local area because they can't find any other work. Uh, many of them are from some surrounding countries. You know, we hear fair number of Serbs, fair number of Belarusians. And it's crystal clear what the military situation is. When you talk about, and there's also specialized Russian units that are there wholesale, uh, as you pointed out, uh, particularly in electronic warfare, as an example. Uh, in addition to that, they created these two political entities that they now insist everybody else talk to. Uh, w the Luhansk People's Republic and the Donetsk People's Republic. And they have no legitimate basis in the population. They have no legitimacy under the Minsk agreements. And they have no legitimacy under Ukraine's constitution. So there's no reason for anyone to be talking to them when Russia's the decision maker and Russia's the one that is, is controlling this. Uh, now, that doesn't make it easy to get Russia to change its mind. But at least if we clear the dust away, uh, we can see what the problem is and how we need to uh, arrange ourselves to deal with it. And we need to, you know, we need to push hard on Russia and be patient because it's not going to get fixed overnight. But keeping, keeping that in front of us, I think, is critically important. And I don't know why it's so hard to talk about, but I don't find it that way. Thank you. I guess uh, to turn it over to uh, Mike now. I have a question for you. I mean, arguably, we've been looking at this, I mean, throughout the day, primarily through a, you know, a U.S. or NATO uh, lens. Uh, you're a Russian expert. I mean, can you give us the Russian uh, side of this? What do you think is their strategy, and, and how, do they, how do they view the situation there? What do they stand to gain? That's a good question. Um, I'll, I'll do my best. So uh, I guess my answer to that would also be somewhat, frankly, pessimistic, which is I heard a lot of optimism here today from friends of Ukraine on the NATO side. Well, Russians are actually pretty optimistic, too, about how Ukraine's looking up for them. And I'll give you a couple of reasons why. Now, all of them are necessarily empirically or objectively valid, but it's important to understand that strategic cultures have their own deep-seated confirmation biases. They often see things through their lens and see facts that are interpreted in a way that tends to validate their own assumptions. So I'll talk a little bit about the Russian side. The Russian strategy is fundamentally medium to long term. Russians have no principal interest in Ukrainian territory. All of it is a bid to control Ukraine's strategic orientation, Ukraine's strategic direction, and down the line, reclaim influence over time. 
Um, I think from Russian perspective, they do feel that they've successfully blocked any path for Ukraine towards NATO. They do, do see Ukraine steadily economically integrating into the EU, but not necessarily taking on those political liberal aspects of, of being the European community, that is, it is possible to integrate with the European Union, but also become more authoritarian or, or stage just as kleptocratic. Uh, the main sort of Russian level sort of lines of effort, as we may call them, would probably be political warfare, subversion, unconventional warfare, um, and downright sabotage, which is the real campaign today. It's a form of indirect warfare and competition. So while there is you know, a line of contact and a steady simmering war of attrition that's very much a position, war of attrition primarily fought with artillery and direct fire, the real sort of level of effort is a level of effort to the depth of the country. And from the Russian perspective, that's really ultimately how conflicts are decided over time, right? It may seem like an economy of force effort, but that's not the economy or the, the cost invested in is not really the driving factor, is that they see that this is the long-term decisive factor in competition. And increasingly, they've really grown to value either non-military means as a decisive element of competition, or means that we would call military but non-kinetic, right? When we talk about cyber warfare, it's not necessarily clear how we, how, how we classify that. Um, and finally, a whole aspect of that is also economic coercion. That's part of what we see in the Sea of Azov. There are certain things they want, and there are certain games that they're playing. Um, previous panel talked a bit about experimentation in Ukraine. Well, in elements like cyber warfare, these things are not only are they relatively new, but they take quite a bit of time to develop. And in domains like cyber, you have to continuously hack to maintain access to test your tools. And so a part of that, yes, Ukraine is, is a test bed. As previous commentators said, it's also a separate conversation that's frankly being held with the United States. We want to understand that some capabilities that are being tested or demonstrated. They're done so for US benefit as well. And Ukraine's kind of the place for Russia to roll them out and to see what they can do. Um, I would say that. Strategic ocean, very strong confirmation bias. Frankly, so does Washington, D.C. and our elites, right? As I live in Washington, I know that there's often a, a sense that Russian leadership is really afraid of Ukraine being a success, and they will, and they will get the democracy, transmit disease, and then, and then the Russians will rise up and overthrow them. Uh, that is not really the sense they get from Moscow. Quite on the contrary, the probably range of view in Russia and Ukraine is Russians see Ukraine, or at least Russian leaders see Ukraine, as somewhere ranging between a semi-failed state or a state that may ultimately fragment down the line. They are not worried about Ukrainian success. They can't even imagine it as a, as, as a thing that might come into being. Okay? They have so long been convinced of a particular vision of Ukraine, they don't even stay up at night. The whole theory that Vladimir Putin wakes up in the morning and he's this regime stability meter that he looks at on the wall, and he sees that maybe it's gone from green to yellow, and then he gets into a control room and starts pulling levers. He's going to do some things in Ukraine, some things elsewhere. Yeah, that's a fantasy. It's not how Russia really works. Um, their general sense is one. Ukraine remains fundamentally a very weak state. In fact, that's their main problem, is that they don't think there's anybody in Ukraine to make a deal with, which is why there's no point for them in making a deal. So they've established Minsk as basically a jobs program that they feel is for negotiations as a jobs program for Europeans, because Europeans love process. And so that's a process where people can get together and do process things with no point or outcome. Right? That's the Russian view. Uh, you know, looking at the country itself, well, Russian outlook is incredibly cynical and elite focused. So yes, Ukrainians are I completely agree with you, unified and, 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 and unite against Russia much more so than they have ever been. But the Russians don't really, the Russian leadership doesn't really see people. It see, sees elites. And the Russian view of elites is, well, there's an election coming up between Poroshenko and Timoshenko. Great. Russians actually like all the elites currently in Ukraine. They don't see the elites as changed. They don't see Ukraine's fundamentally changed as an economy. They see, if anything, Ukraine essentially from their perspective trading out its sovereignty, becoming an economic political dependency of the West, which, by the way, validates all the Russian views on Ukraine to begin with, that Ukraine's not a sovereign country, a weak state, and simply trades its sovereignty out to other countries for benefits. And no, when they look at Poroshenko and Timoshenko, they don't see any elites that they actually have a problem with. They're happy with all these people winning down the line. They just understand that Ukrainian politics is such that no one can give them the kind of deals they'd like to get today. Um, you know, finally, on the... On the competition with the United States, that is, Ukraine as being centered in this piece, well, overall long-running Russian strategy, Soviet strategy, and Russian strategy before a Soviet strategy is basically to be able to have buffer states and to have a say over the strategic orientation over its, all its neighbors. Why? Because the Russian expectation is that all of its neighbors are liabilities, that they will not like Russia, because Russia tended to be for a long time imperialist and expansionist and still has those very much same tendencies, and that they will ultimately be used as weapons against Russia. And so supplying Ukraine with weapons to Russia is exactly validation of their expectations that the United States would use Ukraine as a weapon against Russia. 
And so their intent, of course, over the long term, I'm not necessarily going to say destabilize because it's too inaccurate a term, but to de facto sabotage Ukraine. And of course, it's much easier to sabotage something than it is to build something, right? The job of the spoiler is de facto is much simpler than the job of the person trying to do nation building. Infinitely simpler and infinitely cheaper to accomplish. Russian view overall is that they're going to wait out basically the Europeans, wait for them to get tired. And Ukraine will eventually at some point adapt a multi-vector policy of some kind. Um, and right now they're sort of working to the best they can on the Europeans, right? That is to say, I hope, they hope the Euro Europeans will establish a multi-vector policy themselves. And there's a wider ideological competition where both sides think that the other side doesn't have necessarily the resources to sustain this fight. This is a very interesting debate, right? Because both sides see things that can validate their perspective. Russia has all sorts of problems in medium to long term. I'll wrap up in a second here, Liam. But the Russian outlook on the Europeans is actually, you know, the, the glorious spread of democracy east from Ukraine to Russia. That's not what they see taking place. They feel much more positive about the spread of authoritarianism and lack of cohesion to the European community. And so from their outlook, Ukraine's a piece in a bigger game. And that bigger game is not necessarily going the European way. Quite on the contrary, from their point of view, if you look at it sort of standing back, right, and you see the, the way Russians are interacting with Europeans, they're not so sure that in the long term the European project will last. They're not so sure that there is a, going to be a European project to integrate Ukraine into. In fact, my personal view, and I'll wrap up here, Russians are playing both sides of this integration game. The sabotaging Ukrainian integration is easier, but a harder and a more interesting project is sabotaging the thing that Ukraine's trying to integrate into, and by the time they do, it might not be there. I'm not saying this is a fact, I'm not saying this is a certainty, but it's important to understand that the other bigger piece might not be what it was before. At least that is increasingly the Russian view, and if you write their foreign policy right, and they say, you know, we didn't just abandon Western integration, we feel that Western integration, you're now selling us something you no longer have. The European Union, NATO is not what it was back in those days, too. So they increasingly have their own change view about what are their long-term perspectives in this competition. Maybe objectively false. I'm just, my job is here simply say what I think, how, how they see things from Moscow. Thank you. Ambassador, you do want to? Yeah, I think that's, that's true. I agree very much with that's the Russian mindset. It just underscores how important it is that we therefore not let that materialize into a reality. I don't think it's a reality today. I, th I think it's actually quite untrue. But it is, I believe, the perspective. And that's both Im the importance of uh, reinforcing um, NATO, the importance of the EU hanging together, uh, and the importance of making sure that countries in Central and Eastern Europe and Ukraine uh, and others are, are indeed successful. Uh, there's no doubt that we're going through this uh, patch of rising populist nationalism, far-right governments in some places that are challenging some of the, the institutions and, and values. But um, that's not irredeemable. It's something that we've got to get right. Uh, and uh, the reason for, for this, I would add, is I think in many countries, the pre-existing elites were not addressing what their own populations were worried about. And I think if we can... Uh, have a you know, concerted effort on our part and, and others in, in Europe to kind of refocus on the core values and how to address those issues. I think it's by, by far, uh, um, uh, far away from a foregone conclusion that, that these, these Kremlin perspectives are going to be borne out and like nothing better than to see that they, they play this hand that they have constructed and they realize at the end of the game that their, their cards aren't worth very much. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, I just want to add the one thing that I mentioned. Um, completely agree, and, and I think it's fascinating. Actually, even the Russians themselves are a little bit afraid of their of their own right wing populace. There's nobody in Russia that's afraid about the liberals taking over or whatnot. That's, um, they they fundamentally believe the movements only catch if they have real leadership. They're much more worried about people far to the right of Vladimir Putin at home than they are about uh, liberals. But I said there's one one thing I want to add mm -hmm. um, the, that I found sort of fascinating that's come out over the course of this confrontation the last couple of years is is the real stark difference in views. A lot of Russian behavior in Ukraine is not just due to the fact that Russians don't see Ukraine as a sovereign country. Um, Russian outlook on the international system is fundamentally retrograde. And it is based on a belief system that only great powers have sovereignty. And all small states do not. They have limited sovereignty. And therefore, the doctrine of limited sovereignty is legitimate from their perspective. Right? There are only two kinds of, two kinds of countries in the international system. There's great powers, and there's everybody else. 
And they are second to third class citizens. And the security interests of great power supersede the sovereignty of everybody else. In fact, probably one of the best and most distinct features of the post-Cold War international order that the United States was able to bring to the international system is the fact that small countries actually get to enjoy real sovereignty, even those that live next to great powers, and many times especially those, they actually get to have real choices about what they're going to do with their lives, about their strategic orientation. And that's just a fundamental difference. Their view of the normal international system is just completely different. Yeah, I mean, and, and I can say that is directly in parallel with the way the Kremlin thinks about its own country is that the Kremlin's in charge and nobody else matters. And as a result of that, they constantly underestimate the, the resiliency and the strength of people. Uh, and that's where I think their, their, even their perception of what democracy is, is skewed. Because democracy, they think of as something that is controlled by somebody else that is implanted, and then there it is as opposed to people making their own choices and then building resilience out of that because people are then invested in it. And I think that's, that's ultimately what it makes democracy successful. Gene, I'll turn the question over to you. What, what is the sustainable end game, or, or maybe it's more appropriate to ask, what are some of the potential end games, you know, what, and what can the U.S. do to increase the likelihood of the favorable outcome, or what should we avoid uh, to decrease the you know, less desirable outcomes? Right. Thank you. Greetings, everyone. Uh, thank you for the organizers for putting this together. It's a privilege to be on this, on this panel. Uh, to answer the question, I think it's important to focus and to zero in on uh, several of the key actors. And for the sake of argument, let's 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 uh, talk about uh, very briefly Russia, the international community, and Ukraine in that order. And you'll see why I'm, I'm raising them in, in this order uh, in a couple of. Uh, um, couple of minutes. Uh, Russia is a relatively predictable actor. Michael just covered sort of what the, uh, what the perceptions are likely in the Kremlin. There is this Western logic that could be applied to Russia in which Putin begins to backtrack. He aligns his interests with those of the Russian Federation as opposed to the other way around. He understands that the costs of his misbehavior near and far is prohibitive. He admits that the external threats to Russia are not from the West but from elsewhere. Uh, he realizes that good relations with, with the West are a must uh, for Russia. He respects neighbors' sovereignty and territorial integrity, understands that Russia has made mistakes recently and historically. These are all things that are not going to happen, at least not, not, uh, not any time soon, because his logic is, is not our logic. What's much more likely, uh, to get to the question that was, that was raised, is that Putin will continue to double down and he'll do so in the context of a Russia that's revisionist, revanchist, and neo-imperial. And it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a potent and toxic mix uh, that makes Russia a very difficult uh, actor uh, to interact with. Uh, the fact of the matter is that, is that Russia is a declining power. We can debate to what extent, how quickly, and in what respects. But overall, I think the trajectory is, is clear. Uh, but despite the fact that it's a declining uh, power, power because of it, maybe Putin relies on asymmetric means to keep Russia relevant. So, uh, in one way of putting it, perhaps is that uh, is that he uses unconventional tactics and, and methods conventionally. That's another way to, to maybe consider it. But the, the short of it is that Putin hopes that the West will blink first uh, in this confrontation. And, and I want to underscore that Russia, at this point, whether we like it or not, is in confrontation with us with this country and I would argue with the West uh, in general over values and what the, what the international system uh, uh, should look like. Uh, in terms of, so the, the, Russia, the Russians that we know, Russia under Putin is a relative constant in terms of this dynamic. Uh, the West, A, needs to come to grips with this reality. I think there are, some are, are more in touch with it, with it than others in terms of what, the risk and the threat that Putin's Russia uh, poses. Uh, we uh, can and should contain Russia, and we should push back as necessary. I should mention David's book in this context uh, from a year ago or so the, uh, on containing the Putin regime. Uh, but from my, uh, from my estimation, and, and I certainly agree with what uh, Ambassador Volker said uh, earlier in terms of uh, imposing, uh, uh, punishing Russia, deterring Russia, we are in effect pursuing a strategy of cost and position for, its Russia, for Russia's misbehavior. Uh, in Ukraine and elsewhere. But from my perspective, and I really want to get this point across, is that the real variable, the one that can really make a big difference, is Ukraine itself. So the Ukrainian var mm -hmm. variable in, in all of this. Um, 
Ambassador Yovanovitch yesterday mentioned that uh, Ukraine is fighting two wars, one against Russia, one against the old system. I think that's, that's right on target, and it's really the paradigm in which we should consider uh, the reality of Ukraine today. I won't spend much, too much time on the Russia war uh, and what, the, what it means for the future. Uh, General Abizade, uh, General Hodges, and others uh, addressed that, that issue. Uh, just very briefly, Ukraine is, is doing much better. It's in a much better place now, its posture is much better designed to counter Russian, uh, to Russian pressure. They've learned many lessons. They're sharing some of those. We have a lot to learn from them, no doubt about, uh, about, uh, about that, in the kinetic sense, but also in the cyber domain, as others have, have uh, referenced. But generally speaking, I would have to say that there's a pretty, there's ample policy alignment between uh, Western policies, I understand it, uh, and what Ukraine is trying to do in terms of Russia's ongoing aggression. The, on the domestic side of things, and this is, this is really, for me, that's the key, it's the key question and the key variable. On the domestic side of things, the picture is rather mixed uh, in, ter uh, in terms of uh, what's happening in Ukraine four and a half years after the Euromaidan. Um, corruption remains endemic. I, and I, I like to call things uh, as they are. I'm not always diplomatic. And it is present at, at the highest levels. And that's something that's just part of the reality, part of the fabric of the Ukrainian reality today. Rule of law, which is really key to Ukraine's transformation, is still mostly an aspirational concept. It is not there in practice. Anti-corruption efforts uh, have largely been hollow, disjointed, and to a certain extent theatrical, uh, I would certainly argue. Reform efforts have stalled, and I say this, I'm, I'm, I've been working on the region and in Ukraine specifically for almost 30 years at this point. Uh, I come at it from the philosophy of where Ukraine needs to be at this point to succeed, not necessarily where, where it's coming from. I'm, I'm aware of all the progress that's been made, and, and certainly Ambassador Yohan and others are right to point out that uh, much has been accomplished over the past four years. But for me, the question is, is it enough uh, for Ukraine to succeed? I'm not yet uh, convinced. One of the indicators, since there are representatives of civil, Ukrainian civil society here, one of the uh, indicators for me is that officialdom in Ukraine sees civil society more as a foe at this point than an ally, and that's quite amazing considering the the, uh, the sacrifice that we saw on the, on the Maidan as a legacy and on, on the main square in Kiev just four and a half short years ago. Large scale and much needed foreign direct investment is not there, certainly not on the scale of the size of, of Ukraine, and I'm convinced, and I suspect others would agree, that it's only FDI, large-scale FDI, can, that can really help Ukraine transform exactly. itself. Um, uh, but uh, in terms of the elections, and I'll wrap up shortly, um, the business as usual has, uh, there the are opportunity costs with business as usual, with a return to the old system to a certain extent. I don't want to be too dramatic or to uh, exaggerate too much some of the negative trends. But one of the, one of the opportunity costs, in addition to the FDI that's simply not there, is the growth of populism. We can talk about populist politicians and how they threaten Ukraine's Western trajectory. We should also keep in mind that it's been the misgovernance, I would argue, of the past several years that has opened the door uh, for that populism. And, and uh, not just for the populism, but also for the growing apathy, once again, in Ukrainian, Ukrainian society, which is, which is not great considering that it, in the end, I'm convinced, I'm an optimist in the long run, it'll be civil society to, that transforms, transforms uh, uh, Ukraine. Um, so just to wrap up very quickly, if from my point of view, the sustainable end game that I think we'd like to see in this room and probably elsewhere uh, is, not, is not really possible without fundamental change in how Ukraine is governed. Not rhetorically, but in, 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 but in real practice and how the extent to which not only good laws are passed, but also implemented and the officials work on behalf of those laws and don't try to game the system when the officials actually play by the, rule, uh, by the rules, not with the rules. Uh, and that's an important cultural, political cultural transformation that needs to occur. And finally, just to bring those two wars together, because they are related to whether we like it or not, whether we see it or not, Ukraine cannot prevail against Russia without winning the war at home. And that's something we need to keep in mind. Thank you. Ambassador, do you want to make? Okay, nope, let's hear uh, from Joe. Yeah, Joe, um, I'll ask you the same question in terms of what's a sustainable end game or the potential end games and what can we you know, as, as allies do to increase the likelihood of a favorable outcome or, or avoid uh, to, you know, decrease the, the chance of a less desirable outcome. And before you get started, as Mike reminded us, uh, the doctrine of limited sovereignty. Uh, so you have about 15 to 30 seconds that we'll give you to answer that question. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks, uh, thanks, Liam. And My time's up, that's And we're it. being generous. <laughs> that's great. Um, so, 
where to begin. First of all, I am going to sound starry-eyed again. Okay? Five seconds. So it's interesting that this is all about, we've talked a lot about Russia, and we're trying to talk about Ukraine. I would love someone to say something like, why don't we just let Ukraine be uh, Ukraine? You know, let Ukraine be Ukraine. They have to have the ability, the time, the space to be able to do what it is they've set themselves to do. I'm not ignoring corruption. I'm not ignoring all of the context. I take that as givens, and I assume that everybody knows that in this room. But I must say, I, I'm glad that Canada's not going to be marked against the standards that, that some would set for Ukraine, uh, because I think we'd fail. The other thing is that um, I'd like to separate out sustainable and end game, because I think putting them together is slightly arrogant. Mm. Um, I think we need to focus on what's sustainable. I'd like to think that the key sustainable thing we should focus on in this room and in the international community is our support being sustainable. Kurt, I was thrilled to hear you talk that, about the fact that we need to speak clearly. We speak sotto voce. We speak in contorted ways. We never get out there and say uh, what our friend from the OSCE <coughs> said, and that is uh, actually the conflict can end in an hour because we know who created and we know who can leave and we know how we can solve it. And then we have to rebuild afterward or help Ukraine rebuild afterward. I think that sustainable should be having a, a clear commitment uh, to Ukraine, letting Ukraine get on with what it needs to get on with, being clear in our messaging to them, but in a way that doesn't destroy what they're trying to do, because they are, we've heard so, we've heard some really interesting explanations of what Russia is doing on a daily basis to Ukraine. We have to be you know, conscious of that context. Um, so, and then the end game, well, let, uh, we'll kind of know how it's emerging when it emerges. I think it's a bit ridiculous to try to create that. I went over my 15 seconds, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, before I turn it over to the, the audience for questions, I'll just ask the panel question not to answer now, but uh, you know, to think about it, I'll give you the chance at the end to give any concluding remarks if you want. Uh, but kind of going back to what Gene said in terms of like, who's gonna, who's gonna blink first, right? Uh, are we going to walk away, uh, or are the Russians going to, you know, what will actually, uh, the ambassador laid out some points, but what will actually cause Putin to walk away, and, and how can he do that and save face, at least in the Donbass? Uh, let's go with the easier of the two pieces here. Uh, but, I mean, save that for the end, but just think about uh, what will cause, and it could be Russian actions or maybe it's Ukrainian actions. If it's continued uh, lack of progress, we'll get tired and fatigued, and and that's what the Russians are counting on. Uh, but uh, think about that, and then I'll turn it over to the, the audience for questions. We'll probably do two or three at a time, and, and, then, uh, and, then, and then take the next batch of questions. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, Roman Sanico from Flashpoint again. Um, I just, it's a, just a quick comment. Um, I respectfully disagree with some of the things that were said about Russia's uh, concerns and priorities. I do think that Russia is very much concerned with uh, uh, how things appear to its domestic audience outside. I think very much uh, the nationalism that is being stoked in Europe is not necessarily because it is financially advantageous for Russia to have a destabilized, uh, to have Brexit or something like that. Uh, I think a lot of it is really for domestic audiences saying, see how messy this democracy, this uncontrolled free democracy is. See how much better off you are with our regulated democracy. Uh, Putin is not nearly as popular domestically as uh, a lot of people in the West think he is. And so it really is this, uh, and maybe it's a matter of paranoia, but I really do think that a lot of things that are being done uh, externally, a lot of the misinformation campaigns, a lot of the various things that are being done, the reporting by RT domestically is much more, uh, you know, it's much more uh, kind of virulent even than it is externally. So I do think that there is a lot of concern about the spread of, uh, I don't mean to sound naive, but the, the, per, the appearance of spread of democracy. Uh, so I do think that they are very much concerned uh, about that and that the, the reason that they're stoking the nationalism out there is uh, specifically to make the, uh, the West look so much less appealing uh, to the Russian uh, public at home. Thanks. Yeah, go ahead. Now, uh, yeah, moving to the. We got a second microphone. We can move quicker with the questions. Um, uh, this is David Kramer from. Uh, Florida International University, picking up on that point, I, I, I would caution differentiating between Russia and the Putin regime. 
Um, Russia's national interest, if they were truly followed, would actually want Ukraine to be prosperous, successful, democratic, oriented in the West. Russia's most secure and stable borders are with countries that are members of the EU and NATO. So actually enlargement of those organizations to include more countries along Russia's borders should serve the country's interest. That doesn't serve Putin's interest. I, I would disagree, Michael, that Putin panicked when Ukrainians turned out in the streets and Yanukovych fled. He wasn't ousted, he fled like a coward. Uh, he wasn't overthrown. Putin doesn't want to see that repeated in Russia. Um, and Ukraine would matter more than any other country in the region for the success of a, uh, of a revolution. I would argue that's why he panicked and went into Crimea. He happened to have been rather successful in Crimea, got, to borrow a Stalinist phrase, dizzy with success, and then tried his luck in Donbass, where his luck uh, ran out. But uh, I, I do think that the regime was panicked by what happened in Ukraine. Four and a half years later, they may have a different perspective on things. That is in part what uh, others have been describing about some Ukrainian failures uh, in holding the country back. But um, it seems to me that, that we, we are dealing with a particular problem of the regime, not of the country or the population writ large when it comes to Russia. A, a quick question to, to Kurt, if I can. Um, why do we continue this negotiation process? We're negotiating with the aggressor, with the guilty party that even denies its existence in Ukraine. It won't even admit that it has invaded the country. Why don't we just drop the facade of Minsk? Why don't we just keep ratcheting up sanctions at a certain intervals until Putin decides enough is enough, the, the costs outweigh the benefits? <coughs> Thanks. Yeah, let Mike answer the first one and a half, and then we'll, we'll take one more and then turn it over to Kurt. Yeah, it's a good comment. Well, um, I differ with that perspective. I know there's a strong strain of thought in Washington, D.C., which I feel is deeply ideological and tries to transplant. I, I know, David, sorry. Um, uh, but really, but you, you have come back occasionally for one or two debates. I've seen you. I've seen you. You leave your mark. Um, you know, but that being said, uh, that does try to, it may sort of the subject attribution theory, which is, well, all of Russian foreign policy is just because of domestic politics and regime survival. Yeah, regime survival is pretty important for autocratic regimes, but um, you can basically take most of history and political science and like throw it out the window if that's your theory and outlook on international relations because you don't even need it, right? Because then you can explain everything with that approach. And I think that's quite wrong. Uh, I don't think that Russia has a population of one person whose name is Vladimir Putin, and we just have to divine what he thinks. I agree with David that no doubt the Russian regime, which happens to rule Russia, so it's the regime we have to be dealing with, and we should not theorize of what Russians would want, right? Because there's a very, like, i put, this, the endless missionary culture, right, that believes that, okay, inside Russians, there's just Americans dying to get out. And if, yeah, 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 I know exactly where it comes from. I hear it all the time, right? And that, and that really, Russians themselves don't share these views. Like, they would not have supported Putin going into Crimea, or they would not have supported Donbass. Oh, I really disagree with that. So suffice to say, one, and I do, I do think Russians actually panicked, but they didn't panic because they thought, well, Yanukovych got ousted, and that would happen to me. Actually, probably the most horrific things to them was back in 2011 what happened um, in uprising to Muammar Gaddafi. That Vladimir Putin really did personally react to. Uh, but looking to Ukraine, their belief was fundamentally that this thing was an intelligence operation, right? That the, the Maidan was a staged intelligence operation. With their principal concern is, and they are fundamentally a national security elite and a counterintelligence elite. Not everyone, but at least most of the people that make the big decisions on, on what to do. And they really believe that the fragmentation of the Russian empire isn't over. And that the United States came for Ukraine. And then once they take Ukraine, they will come for Russia. They're not worried about Russian people sort of rising up on their own. They don't believe that such a thing exists. Like, that it could just happen organically. They believe it must be paid for, it must be organized. Now, most of the answers to that have not been foreign policy. This is, I'm sorry, this is the Rube Goldberg theory of how international relations work and how countries make decisions. They have done a lot to bold down Russia, all right? They've done a lot in the media space, in the, politics, in the legal space, with the National Guard. That is their answer to managing a political uprising or a Maidan in Russia. The FSB manages the elite, the National Guard manages the people. A lot of the foreign policy is not necessarily for that. They generally do have objectives that they are trying to pursue. I won't argue with the fact that they're concerned with regime survival, but that's not really the sole source of Russian policy making. 
probably take we'll take a couple of questions and then uh, yeah, you want to go, go ahead pretty soon though. Yeah. So. Okay. Thank you. Elise Giuliano, Columbia University. Another great panel. Thank you so much. So much to think about. I have an, a question for Ambassador Volker. Um, could you talk could you talk a little bit more about uh, a little bit more about the um, how you conceptualize peacekeeping or dealing with DNR and LNR? And in particular, I study public opinion, and I wanted to challenge a bit about what you said about no legitimacy about DNR and LNR, not because I'm, I want to claim they have legitimacy. We just don't know. There's not really any good polling data. Um, but what I, I did learn from talking to USAID this summer in Ukraine um, is that a lot of people on the contact line go back to DNR and LNR to have babies and for health care because it's free. And this is, a, this is a, a point not really about legitimacy and what they really believe deeply, but like who's giving them services? And if the Ukrainian government's cutting off their pensions and there's a government in DNR and LNR who's providing services, that's kind of a, a problem. So I was just wondering a little bit about how you, know, you think about that and also how you would think about um, uh, bringing into a negotiating process some representatives of DNR, or, or how to deal with all of the people who work for the DNR and LNR administration. Because over the years, they have kind of like built up quite a few people who work there. So now we have this whole new set of people who, though they may or may not be ideological, you know, they have jobs and they're worried about their jobs. So just your thoughts on a, a little bit more deeply about the administrations there. All right. Un unfortunately, uh, Ambassador Volker will have to leave early, so I think he's going to answer these questions and some concluding remarks, and then he'll Great. have to leave. Uh, thank you. I uh, appreciate that. Uh, and I, I apologize, but I, I do need to get across town. Um, so first off, um, let me start with David's. Um, I think that continuing these negotiations serves a couple purposes. Uh, one of them, it keeps the transatlantic community unified. If we didn't have a way of talking with Russia, we would be losing the EU and France and Germany. So I think keeping it together is important. Another is there is no military defeat of Russia that's going to happen. So the only way we get them out of there is if we agree at some point as to something that's going to happen. Now, it doesn't mean that we agree to what they want, uh, but we've got to keep a, a channel open for that. Uh, the third is that the Minsk agreements serve two critically important uh, functions. One of them, they are the piece of paper by which Russia has committed to the restoration of Ukraine's territory. So we don't want to lose that. And second, it's the legal basis of sanctions that the EU keeps in place and that we also keep in place. So we don't lose that either. We want to keep the legal foundation clear. Um, now, you're right that it's not going anywhere, but I think as a device, it serves a lot of purposes and it could come in handy another time. Uh, on um, the um, peacekeeping, so a couple of things that you raised, uh, and, I th and I think you make some very good points. One of them is how it would be structured. What we're imagining is a UN mandated peacekeeping force that would be staffed on a voluntary basis by nations, and there are quite a few who have said they'd be interested. And it would be a transition mechanism. The, the whole point is to break this logjam, which is the Minsk agreements. Um, Russia complains that Ukraine's not doing enough. Ukraine says, well, Russia hasn't done anything, and there's no security, so how could we, for instance, have local elections when there's not even freedom of movement? And uh, to break through that, we suggest that a international a UN mandated force would be able to produce security and create time and space where those steps can be taken. And then through the logic of Minsk, the territory is restored to Ukraine. Now, about the two people's republics, uh, I am pretty hard line on this, uh, that even though they are there, and even though there are people working for them, that is, that is still less than what existed before in terms of an economy and people having jobs and industry and having a higher standard of living. And they are not seen as legitimate political entities. I think you can tell from the massive outcry when the head of the Luhansk People's Republic was suddenly removed and like, crickets. <laughs> and the same thing with the assassination of Zaharchenko. The, the massive public uprising over this was just um, deafening. Uh, so I don't think there's a whole lot of public <laughs> faith in, in these as institutions. I think mostly people just want their lives back. They, they want to get on with you know, having a job and being able to have their farm and their land, their family, travel, not get blown up. Um, this, this is what I think people are looking for. And I have been very 
tough on the Ukrainian government and continue to be of not doing enough for these people. That there is so much more the Ukrainian government could position itself to do to try to help the, the people of the Donbas. And if they are unable to deliver, they need to make clear why. Uh, that somebody is occupying this territory and obstructing it, because otherwise they would. That is not the message you get from the Ukrainian government right now. I think it's a huge, uh, it's a huge blind spot that they've got, and they, they should be trying to correct that. And in terms of future jobs, yes, people may, be, if you lose these administrations, yes, those people getting paid by the Russians right now will no longer be paid by the Russians. But that's where we would need to have a reconstruction effort that would create an actual economy again. I think you would find uh, in Europe and some businessmen in Ukraine who would be willing to invest in that. And the final thing I wanted to say, I hope that we're on the record and the media is rolling here, um, is that uh, we did have uh, an introduction of a special status law into the RADA uh, now, which will come up for a vote on Thursday. And this is important because this is one thing where uh, I just gave the example of the Ukrainian government not doing enough for the people of the Donbass. This is one where I think the Ukrainian government has demonstrated a couple of times now that they are willing to try to do what they can to keep its commitment up on the Minsk agreements and that they will renew the, spe they're seeking to renew again the special status law for the Donbass, which would take effect if in fact the Russians get out, there is peace and um, and they um, can see the restoration of the territory t to Ukrainian control. Uh, they did it last year, and Russia did absolutely nothing. I know why this is hard politically to pass in Ukraine, but I just want to commend the government for putting in the legislation, and I would hope that the RADA members would vote in favor, because it is important not to give Russia that gift of being able to complain about something that Ukraine didn't do. And it also, it's very important for keeping the sanctions regime in place in Europe, that uh, they can't use this argument against Ukraine either. Thank you, Ambassador. I uh, appreciate uh, <laughs> participating in the panel. Uh, turn it over to the audience for next uh, batch of I'm questions. Gonna have, I'm, yes, I'm gonna sir. have to duck out, so thank you all. For, it's good to see you. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Rob Person. I teach uh, Russian and post-Soviet politics at West Point. Uh, so this question was going to be uh, directed at the ambassador, um, but I'll- uh, He's still here. Maybe uh, uh, toss this out as a jump ball for the rest of the panel. Um, so uh, Ambassador Volker did talk about sort of the, the urgent need to tackle the oligarchic system, uh, you know, which really has perme permeated uh, the entire economic and, and political sphere in, Ukraine. Uh, he talked about sort of uh, both the need for good legislation and implementation. Uh, my question is uh, if, um, you know, essentially the oligarchs and their agents have so fully captured both state and economy in Ukraine, who is to do the implementation? Um, who, are the, uh, who are the actors that uh, can actually take on those interests, considering that uh, the machinery of state um, is, is so thoroughly uh, occupied, if, if you will. Uh, and then the second part of that question is, what concrete measures um, are necessary, feasible, and uh, have some reasonable chance of success in, uh, in making any difference <laughs> on that front? Thank you. Uh, another question. In, yeah, we'll go back here. Mr. Michael Kaufman, um, interesting uh, that you might have uh, brought up uh, the issues of how confident uh, the Russians are. Are they really that confident, uh, given the fact uh, that the Greek Orthodox patriarch is now about to uh, allow Ukraine to walk the Ukrainian Orthodox Church to walk out of the Moscow-dominated uh, uh, church? Uh, would that is that part of that wonderful confidence that that Putin exudes? Take a couple. I'll field a couple more questions, and then we'll we'll hit the panelists. Thank you. The uh, Ukrainian infrastructure uh, minister said that Ukraine aims to uh, boost its role in China's Belt and Road Initiative. And China has also stated that it considers Ukraine uh, 
a critical part of the Belt and Road. Uh, what do you think will happen when China makes its presence known through the initiative, and how will China's presence uh, affect stability in the region? Yeah, Rick. Yeah, one of the areas we initially alluded to but haven't uh, spoken much about is the importance of international co cooperation vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine and, and Russia. And I'm wondering if perhaps our panelists could talk about the European continental power, and I would have directed this to the ambassador as well, and that's Germany. How critical is Germany to our end game? And what are the prospects that when things get tough, the Germans will still be with us or not? Gene, I'll let you uh, attack first. Thank you. <laughs> uh, let me just uh, very briefly touch on, on several of these. Uh, you raised a very good question about the oligarchic system. Uh, the oligarchs are not interested in dismantling it. Obviously, they benefit from it. And there are those who say that even the president is an oligarch, so that, that compounds the challenge that you're, that you're uh, referencing. Uh, I'm not very optimistic that without pressure from civil society and pressure from the international community, uh, we can achieve a transformation of, of the current system that's, that's in play uh, in Ukraine. This does get to the question uh, that was raised earlier in terms of giving the Ukrainians time and space to do their own thing. I think it's a, it's a balancing act. Of course, in the, you know, first and foremost, it's a, Ukraine is, a, a belongs to the Ukrainians. Uh, they have spoken, the people have spoken, and by the way, I differentiate between Ukrainian civil society and post-Soviet political elites. I do that for a reason. I think civil society is ahead of the political class in terms of, in terms of Ukraine's uh, orientation. But it, it'll, it's, we have to be there, for the, first and foremost, for the people of Ukraine. Elites come and go, and, or at least they should. Uh, but it's, it's to help the people of Ukraine to transform their country into, a, into the European state that they uh, envision. Um, it's a real, uh, it's a real challenge, and we need to keep the elites feet to the fire in terms of the promises that they made at the time of the Euromaidan. Uh, these, I don't see why we have to expend so much time and energy trying to convince them to do what they themselves say, said they would do, that they would promise to do, and that is transform Ukrainian, uh, to transform the Ukrainian economic system and remove, separate the oligarchs from the political process. That hasn't happened. In fact, things are very much back to the way that. Uh, uh, that they were. If Ambassador Volker were here, he would also uh, reference uh, in more detail his, his sort of the concept of, uh, of um, de demonopolization, which is important uh, in the Ukrainian context. But that too would need, I think, uh, for, uh, the agents of change in Ukraine would need help from the outside uh, as well. On the question, just very briefly, on the um, question of orthodoxy. No. If I, I know you asked Michael, but I wanted to just say a word or two. Wait a minute, I, you're not Michael. I'm not. That's my middle name, so I can. <laughs> I know we hang out a lot, but you're not Michael. <laughs> I think it's. I think it's huge. I mean, Michael will answer the question, but it's 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 potentially hugely transformative because, because while while Russia does not dominate Ukraine outright today, the Russian Orthodox Church has remained an imperial institution, and if this goes forward, as you referenced, it'll, it'll, it changes the dynamics considerably, and I would argue for the better. On the China uh, question. Um, you know, China, China operates differently from, from the West. The expectations are different. Uh, the business model is, ve is very different. I'm not sure it's necessarily great for Ukraine to go down that road, especially when it, if it can transform itself and attract Western money and, and Western businesses. I think it would be more, more in concert with the way that Ukraine, at least rhetorically, sees itself uh, uh, in, in the future. And on Germany, sort of the big elephant in the room when one talks about Germany and Ukraine is Nord Stream 2 and, and the energy uh, link there. I think Nord Stream 2 is a very dangerous project. I'm not convinced that it's a commercial a project. In fact, I'm pretty sure it's something else. Um, it's also a project that's very dangerous for the region uh, because it, uh, there's no doubt that it threatens others in, that, in the Central U East European space. But also, uh, should it go forward, I think it would uh, uh, encourage Russia or the enable Russia to be more aggressive vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, uh, and that's something that's very dangerous and destabilizing, so we should consider it in that broader scheme of things. Jill? Yeah, I'll just, uh, two, two of the issues. So on the, on the oligarchs, I'd just like to add to that. I mean, we know about that dynamic. We've heard about the dominance of the, the economic and the political space. Um, but there is, under that system, 
an effort to put in place some governance. And I know this, again, sounds a little bit uh, naive, but there, you have a bit of a schizophrenic system in, in Ukraine. You've got the president and the oligarchs and all of that, but then you have a prime minister who's actually been mandated to get on with reform. And there are these 10 pilot ministries that are laying out the basis for some sort of recognizable governance. Um, and that should uh, institutionalize, to a certain extent, delivery of services to citizens. It's where the transparency accountability is supposed to be put in place. It's a very, very long, difficult, kind of boring road to tread. But uh, we shouldn't forget that uh, by just focusing on the, the oligarchs. Of course, they're a dominant uh, presence in the political system, but they aren't the only presence uh, in the political system. And the second question that I take is on international cooperation. And this came up a couple of times. General Abizea, General Parker spoke to it. I mean, there's no question that we are not the sum of our parts internationally. Yeah. We're out there. A lot of good stuff is being done. It's being done uh, in stovepipes of excellence. Uh, we, uh, we don't connect up uh, sufficiently. And I think that if we want a sustainable effort to get back to kind of the topic of, of the panel, we, re we re really need to do uh, better. We need to work horizontally. We need to coordinate, and not just coordinate in the stuff that we're doing on the ground, but it's from the conception of what it is and the discussions with the Ukrainians to try to identify those things that they need that are helpful, that stuff that they don't need, and that's where we can be much more effective with our messaging, too. Mike? Yeah, um, I'll be brief with that the question right there. Well, I didn't say they were confident. I said they were optimistic, we're looking medium to long term. Um, in, in indirect competition, it's interesting because they've lost the utility and efficacy of some tools, for example, like energy being one, but they've gained and discovered new ones by blocking off the Sea of Azov as a form of economic coercion and other things they've been trying experimenting with. So over time, we've seen that some traditional existing tools of influence and, and subversion have fallen off in terms of their utility or their viability, and new ones they've discovered or have started using testing or by virtue of things they've done, they've acquired. On the real impact of sort of autocephaly for Ukraine, well, I mean, I, th I agree with Gene. I, th I think it would be an important change, and I'd probably lose quite a bit there in terms of influence. It is hard for me to predict for two reasons. One, I myself am not an expert on religion or orthodoxy, nor do I advance myself as such, right? Two, I highly doubt a lot of people in the Kremlin are either, so they themselves may not fully understand the implications of it, but are probably trying to figure out right now, right? Because it's not really run by people who are experts in that field. That said, though, I do think for them it's probably quite worrisome. I think it would be an important change. All right, take the final round of uh, questions now from the audience. <laughs> they must have heard the bottles opening in the back. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so what I will uh, do is I will allow uh, the uh, panelists, if you have any concluding remarks, I guess we'll start, uh, I guess we'll start with Gene, if you, if you have any concluding remarks. Yeah, just, uh, just very, very briefly, since the bottles are being uncorked, uh, <laughs> I want to underscore that Ukraine's struggle is not just uh, its struggle, it's a, it's a struggle for the West in general. It is impressive that in, that, uh, in 2018 there are people out there who are putting their lives on the line to see their country succeed, to escape the, the, sort of the, 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 the post-Soviet swamp, if you will, uh, and uh, come back, return to Europe. And I say that on purpose. I think Ukraine has, has, a, has an old uh, history, has roots in Europe. Um, uh, they believe in the European values and want to be part of the West. Uh, and it's very impressive, and again, they are fighting our fight, too. Uh, and that's something we should not forget when we consider all these reference points, like the Budapest Memorandum and other things. This is not just their fight, it's our fight. Thank you. Mike? Um, I'm going to take off of what the common gene made in this, in this talk about whether, whether Russia's a power in decline about the balance of power. So. Here's my personal objective. Russia's in decline relative to China. It has not been in decline relative to the United States and been resurgent relative to the United States in the last 10 years. That's the reality. The United States in the relative balance of power compared to other countries is not resurgent. It's actually probably been in decline compared to Russia and China. That's the reality going forward. Um, for me on the conversation of, of whether Russia's in decline or resurgent, the challenge is that it's always in a cycle where the, the sort of history of Russia is as a country that um, always, one, stagnates relative to the West from a technology, sociological, and economic standpoint, then through state coercion and mobilization whips itself into a process of self-flagellation, desperately tries to catch up 
and mobilization of the whole state and economy. Then it runs out of breath, and then it starts stagnating again. And so depending on when you have this conversation, maybe in the last five years we've been talking about resurgent Russia, five years from now I'm confident we'll be talking about stagnating Russian decline relative to its resurgence now, and 10 years after that, hopefully I'll still be doing this, we'll be having a panel where we'll probably be talking about Russian resurgence relative to the previous period of Russian decline, because it goes on a cycle like this. That's the reality of it. Um, but, but I do think it's important to understand that it's, it, it, a, a lot of it is very much how you play your hand, and one of the arguments I have been having quite a bit in DC is about the necessity for the return of actual statecraft. So whatever you may think of Russian, of Russian power, and I don't think Russia is in any position to change the structural balance of power in the international system, but they bench quite a, bit above, quite a bit above their weight. I'm not so sure the United States does, to be frank, right? And that's just the reality of it. A big, challenge, a big part of it is actually how well you're able to engage in statecraft. And Jill, you have five seconds or less. So I'm going to end with a, a quote that just came to me, and I think it was Conrad Adenauer, and he said, an infallible way of conciliating a tiger is to allow oneself to be devoured. I think we need to help uh, Ukraine and the West to be indigestible. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Uh, I'll let the, uh, my fellow panelists, you guys can leave the stage while I, uh, I'm going to introduce the, the, the final speaker of the, of the conference. Uh, but before, before doing that, since Karen's going to do the concluding remarks, I just want to make a few. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, you guys can okay, step thanks. off. Yeah. We're yeah. Dismissed. You're dismissed. We're dismissed. Um, but since Karen will do the concluding remarks, I just wanted to say uh, you know, thanks to all the participants for coming, uh, especially those coming from uh, Ukraine and Europe. I know firsthand, uh, despite how frequently you do the uh, travel over here, it's never easy, so uh, appreciates everybody's time for coming here. Uh, special thanks to Mr. Vinnie Viola for helping us, uh, allowing Karen and I and our institutes to put on this conference uh, and this uh, symposium uh, tackling this important issue. So uh, thanks to you again. Uh, so uh, now I'll introduce our closing speaker. Everybody knows Ambassador Yovanovitch, a career diplomat currently serving as a U.S. ambassador to Ukraine. It's been a pleasure working with her for the past two years, uh, and it's comforting to know we have such a distinguished uh, and talented diplomat uh, in such an important region for us. Uh, and in many countries, uh, generally uh, most of our trips to Ukraine, we got to see the ambassador on the way in and the way out, and, and probably uh, in many locations that's something you don't necessarily want to do, uh, but we always look forward, I know General Abizé does uh, look forward to uh, seeing you on the way in and, and seeing you on the way out. So. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's always enjoyable. So uh, I guess we'll turn it over to you uh, okay. for your remarks. Well, Liam, thank you. And I have to say this is um, kind of the, the really toughest slot. It's not uh, you know, the, the difficult after lunch slot. It's the pre-drink slot, especially after we've had, uh, you know, at the beginning of the day when General Abizaid spoke and gave us you know, sort of the seven, uh, the seven rules uh, you know, from the tablet, I thought, God, what is anybody else going to say today? Because, I mean, he's really said it all. Um, but I think it's been such a rich day, and I just want to add my thanks to, uh, to Liam and Karen and Vinny and everybody else that has organized um, this conference today, because I think it really gives us uh, a, lot, um, a lot to think about. So I, I really feel that uh, the panelists, um, uh, you know, in the, in the preceding panel, uh, kind of summed everything up pretty well. And so I'm just going to kind of repeat what they said. Uh, so you know our construct of uh, Ukraine um, being, you know, basically fighting two wars at the same time. Uh, which, you know, how difficult is that? Fighting, uh, fighting the Russians uh, in uh, what we've heard about all day today, a hybrid war that. You know, maybe Putin isn't staying up at night, but I'm staying up at night thinking about that. I, you know, I don't really feel that I and maybe some of the rest of you in the room have the mental construct, the tools to really think about that in the right way. And um, I think you know, it's something we all need to be thinking harder about and, um, and working harder on. Uh, because as has been said many times today, Ukraine uh, is really uh, the Ukrainian fight uh, in this hybrid war. It's the front line for Ukraine, but it's also the front line for Europe and therefore for the United States. And we have a stake in that outcome. We need to be all in, in my opinion, just like the Russians are all in. And if we're not all in, uh, and I include the Europeans in this as well, um, I think that uh, you know that uh, that that is not uh, going to be a good thing. Uh, and and there are two reasons for that. I mean, one is the issue of. Um, 
uh, Ukraine's sovereignty, territorial integrity. Uh, Ukraine needs to win that fight because that goes to the heart of the international order. And if, uh, you know, if it's okay for Russia, or any other country for that matter, to just you know, grab a chunk of Crimea, grab a chunk of the Donbass, grab a little bit here, grab a little bit there, I mean, where does that leave us? And so I think it's important that Ukraine uh, prevail, and it goes, that principle, principle goes beyond uh, just Ukraine, as important as it is for Ukraine. Um, so across the spectrum, I think that uh, we in the United States need to think about how we can be, as Kurt was saying, more clear, how we can raise the costs uh, for Ukraine, how we can be, I don't want to say pro, uh, provocative, because we don't want to be provocative, but how we can be proactive in sort of setting, uh, you know, setting those guardrails, setting, um, setting limits. With the war uh, here at home, um, again, it's what kind of, and uh, when I say here at home, I'm referring to my Ukrainian home. Um, what kind of uh, country is Ukraine going to be? And uh, the Ukrainian people have chosen, you know, we've heard over and over and again today, uh, 2004, 2014. Anna, uh, who may be here, is there, um, said that really, though, it wasn't a choice in, two, in, in 2014. It, it's a continuum that the Ukrainian people, and of course, I know many of you are students of Ukrainian history, so going back over the centuries, um, the, uh, the intense desire to be free. And I think that's something that as Americans, we can get behind. We, you know, especially so close to, um, uh, you know, the uh, Boston and the Boston Tea Party, I hate to say that in Manhattan, but uh, <laughs> we're not talking sports, right? Uh, <laughs> but I mean, you know, we are a people who fought for our independence, and I think uh, we recognize it when other people uh, fight for the same. And I think it's really clear that the Ukrainians have chosen democracy, they've chosen market economy, they've chosen European values, and um, that is the Ukrainian vision, and I think that's something we can get behind. Uh, and so, you know, from my point of view, the only, as difficult as it is, and we've heard, you know, all the challenges all day long, um, as difficult as it is, I think the only way to keep on going forward for Ukraine is to keep on going forward. And that means, you know, two elections, through elections, Progress is never, you know, a straight line forward. It doesn't matter whether you're in business or, or uh, you know, in government. I mean, there's zigs and there's zags and there's step backwards and so forth. But Ukraine needs to keep on moving forward, and we need to get behind them to help them do that. Um, I don't necessarily disagree with you, Anders, that Russia, you know, as it is uh, preparing for the Ukrainian elections, that's a really scary <laughs> sentence, um, is, uh, you know, trying to ensure that all candidates are pro-Russian. Uh, I don't necessarily uh, disagree with that. And, um, but here's what I would say, that um, what they're not counting on, and, um, you know, we heard a lot about, uh, you know, uh, you know, possibly what's going on in Putin or the Russians head from, from, from Michael, I think they fundamentally don't get Ukraine and that the Ukrainian people have changed. They are not buying what Russia is selling. They have set their own course and it is a course uh, that, is, uh, that is westward. So what do we do? You know, what does this mean for us and our policy? And I think it means that we double down. I think we need to look for ways that we can continue to help build Ukrainian resilience, whether it is on the battlefield and all the different domains that we've been talking about, as well as in uh, you know kind of the domestic fight uh, with regard to um, to uh, to reforming uh, Ukraine. And I think that mean, means more resources. We've seen the Congress be very generous. Um, more resources, more attention, uh, and um, I think you know, continuing down that path. I will say something that may be controversial here. Um, this has been a pretty polite audience, um, but I, you know, I was waiting to hear, uh, I mean, obviously there were criticisms of US policy, we should be doing more, we should be more nuanced here, et cetera. I didn't um, necessarily hear um, we need to be doing something totally different. And if I misheard that, please come up to me afterwards and tell me <laughs> what we need to be doing more of, less of, totally different. Because we're interested in, um, you know, I mean, I wish there were a silver bullet, frankly, and if you've got it, I'm buying. Um, but um, are, are, we're also interested in good ideas because, you know, 
in today's foreign policy, there is certainly statecraft, but what we also know is that it's not just um, about what elites think in the State Department or in other parts of our, our, of our government. It's uh, much broader and um, many people have great ideas and we want to hear from you. Um, so I, um, I also wanted to note that uh, Uliana, who had to leave, she mentioned that um, you know, Ukraine's friends and international stakeholders shouldn't be, uh, you know, preaching and teaching. But the Ukrainians actually know a lot about their own country, and this is their vision, and they know how to get there. And I think, I think that's something that we need to sort of internalize um, and remind ourselves about, because, uh, because I think that is, is uh, very true in many ways, that we need to be humble as we, um, as we uh, approach our uh, important work of supporting Ukraine. I would also say, on the other hand, that I think many of the people in this room, many people more broadly who are helping Ukraine, have a lot to share. We have a lot of experience, and I think uh, it's important that, that, um, that we have an opportunity to do that. And I would, I would also say that one of, uh, we want to encourage Ukraine. Um, we want to be supportive of Ukraine, but that doesn't mean unconditionally. You know, we've heard from a lot of different speakers, including Jean, uh, that not everything is, a, is perfect as Ukraine is pursuing its, its future. That's true. As Jill said, you know, even in developed democracies, I mean, this is a huge challenge. Um, I, would, I would say that the stakes are high for all of our countries, but they're really high for Ukraine because Ukraine um, has a very powerful adversary uh, that is doing everything it can to undermine Ukraine. And so Ukraine needs to get it right and it needs to get on with the task. And so um, you know, we, we uh, do have um, a role, I think, that we can play in terms of helping uh, Ukraine, including, um, including in our assistance, including perhaps with putting conditionality on some of that assistance. Um, so I would also just finally say that um, I think all of us in this room, or else you wouldn't be here, uh, believe that we have a, a stake in Ukraine's success, as Kurt said. And um, you know that's, that's like a really easy sentence to say, but what does it mean in practice? So we talked about that all day, and no doubt we will be talking and doing um, in the future. But here's what I want to leave you with, which is you know, from my perspective, um, assisting Ukraine in um, you know, uh, these two wars, in the, the, the hybrid war and also the war for Ukraine's future, I think that's the right thing to do. You know, if you're just thinking about this kind of in a principled way, and what is the right thing to do? But you know, if that isn't persuasive to you, I think it's a smart thing to do for the United States and for Europe, because we have a stake in what happens in Ukraine. And therefore, we should not be indifferent, but I think we should double down in terms of our assistance in trying to help the Ukrainian people get to where they want to go. So with that, I'm going to stand aside so everybody can run to the bar. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Thank you for yesterday and for today. So um, I'm just going to conclude. First, let me thank my fantastic staff. Let me thank Liam for being so wonderful and the Modern War Institute. I just want to say a couple of um, uh, um, co comments to the end, um, sort of why, why the center does this and why we're so happy to partner with the Modern War Institute. And, that, and there's a couple of things. The center started 15 years ago in response to 9-11. And I thought that would be a five-year, 10-year project at the most. But really, what the center has become, and I think there are a lot of institutions that are starting to understand this, is trying to understand national security, not in the context of 9-11, but in the context of the 21st century. 21st century is different. And there is no doubt when you're talking about hybrid war, you're talking about cybersecurity, whatever it is, um, that uh, displaced persons, this century poses conflicts that we've, and challenges that we've known about in the past that have really 
started to catch up with us. And what the center has been trying to do for the past however many years, largely with the, the uh, support and the encouragement of Vinnie Viola and his family and, and others, is to really sort of help others who know much more than we do here at the center articulate what those challenges are and be creative about some of those responses. And I want to say one other thing. We believe in convening. You know, so many foundations and others and institutions say, what's the product? What's the product? What are you going to produce? And I have to say that we'll produce things. We always produce things. We produce a daily news service. OK. But I really believe that what happened here today and yesterday is the product. The product is how we hear each other. The product is how we go and tell other people what happened here. The product is how we make our world a better place by knowing one another. So with that, enjoy. And thank you for coming. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> that was fun.